I'd like to talk about is mTOR and longevity, right? So, so I mean, M mTOR has become famous in the longevity field because um, apparently suppressing mTOR leads to longevity, or at least it, it certainly has been shown to do that in animal models. I guess we're, we're still working on proving that in, in human models. Uh, can you, do you know what the, the mechanism of that is? Do we understand why stopping mTOR or a down-regulating uh, leads to longer health span? Yeah, that, that's, you know, that's the proverbial million dollar question, right? And, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you two answers to that. So I think you're, you're right, both uh, genetic and pharmacological evidence and multiple uh, model organisms from unicellular yeast to, to mice, likely to dogs, shows that modulation of mTORC1, specifically suppression of mTORC1, promotes lifespan uh, and, and health span, at least for many tissues. Um, now keep in mind, some people confuse this, and I see sometimes on people on social media commenting on this. If you fully inhibit mTORC1, a cell is dead, an organism is dead, okay? So what we're talking about is partial suppression. You cannot live without mTORC1, as far as we can tell. An organism cannot survive. So we're not talking about complete suppression. We're, we're actually talking about quite modest suppression. And, and in many ways, um, the effect of mTORC1 uh, suppression on fitness, overall sort of quality of a cell and organism is U-shaped. You suppress, it, it's better. Um, and you could actually say even in, in, in uh, actually a U-shape would be a good way. Um, too much mTORC1 is bad, but too little mTORC1 is bad as well. Hmm. So everyone wants to know, what is it that mTORC1 does that promotes lifespan and health span? And, and this is, you know, sort of a very common human uh, uh, sort of desire, right? Is to simplify and to say, okay, this is the thing. Right. So I, I'll give you two answers to this. One is that probably if we go back to that analogy, that building analogy, let me pretend that I want to keep a building looking youthful or even take an old building and renovate it. I wouldn't be able to do one thing, right? It's not that I could change the electrical system and say, ah, I got a new building now, right? Think about all the things you'd have to do to a building to, to rejuvenate it or even to keep it not aging. So I would argue that the reason mTORC1 has an impact on, on lifespan, health span, and so few, because the, the counter to that is, well, why do so other why do so few other pathways not have that, right? If every if perturbing everything had a similar fragile lifespan, then mTORC1 wouldn't be unique. So the real question is why is mTORC1 unique and other things are not unique? That's the the real, more fundamental question. And I would argue the reason is that mTORC1 does so many things. There are very few interventions that you can do to a cell and to an organism that lets you regulate so many important processes, right? From the making of protein of nucleic acids to autophagy, which I'm sure your, your listeners know about in terms of breaking down cellular components and having to remake them. So I would argue that the real answer is that it does many, many things. And it's one of the few ways that you can give a single intervention such as rapamycin, which is of course the most famous pharmacological inhibitor of mTORC1 and trigger so many processes in the cell. So that's my real answer. If you force me and say, David, what is the most important process? And I think the evidence bears towards this, it would be autophagy. It would be the activation of autophagy likely accounts for a significant percentage of the capacity of molecules like rapamycin to promote lifespan and health span. And that, you know, intellectually is satisfying to us because autophagy is engulf material, destroy it, and then let the cell make more of it. And so to all of us, it seems like, okay, take an old house and throw things out and buy new things. So it's intellectually satisfying. And the, the evidence, at least in worms, I think suggests that, that a good percentage of the inhibition of, of the pro lifespan effects of inhibiting mTORC1 through autophagy. Not all though, but a good percentage. Right. So we, you said that it's basically, a, it's like an AND gate, right? So it has to have everything. So it should be quite easy to suppress. So you, we just have to remove a few components from the mix. Um, right. I mean, you mentioned like hypoxia or, or perhaps cold. I mean, so that's, that's how cold showers work. As a... No, I, I, well, um, <laughs> I and I, 
it is some of the least heat shock for sure. So the absence, you know, a lot of times with mTOR one, it's the absence of the noxious state. Right. That is what it's what it's really looking for. Um, so so I think you're you're right that there are many ways that we could perturb this pathway. Um, that with the with the caveat that you know a lot of the work that people like my my lab has done my lab has done. You know, we worked in relatively simple systems and cells and culture. I think what we're increasingly finding when we go in vivo is that of all those, you know, people always say, well, why so many signals? Well, because, you know, the, the cell cares a lot of things to be able to grow. But I think what's going to happen in vivo is that we're going to find that cells are specialized. Mm-hmm. Some are going to care more about one input than others. So, for example, we're, we're already finding that some cells seem to care more about amino acids than growth factor signaling and vice versa. Um, so, so yeah, there are lots of ways of perturbing it. Uh, you know, some of those then affect all tissues. In some cases, you don't want to affect all tissues. And so I think that the challenge with mTOR1 inhibition is how you affect the tissues you want or perhaps the tissues that you don't, right? Inhibiting mTOR1 in the muscle, yeah, it's probably going to be sort of pro-atrophy. Um, mm. it, it, it's uh, at least prolonged uh, inhibition. Right. Um, so, so- so that brings me to another kind of question. So do we know whether mTOR changes over time within, have you ever looked, you know, like, does it express differently in a 60 year old than in a 20 year old? Yeah, I, it, it's a good question. I don't, I don't think we almost have any data on, in terms of, you're saying that the, the level of it itself probably doesn't so much, but whether other components of the pathway or upstream regulators do is, is likely. Um, what, what I think there is significant evidence for is that over time, mTORP1 does seem to become activated, right, in a number of tissues. That, that aged animals, for example, if you look in the muscle, where I think it's most dramatic, if you look in the liver, mTORP1 seems to be somewhat hyperactive, um, which again fits with our idea that mTORP1 activity is bad for lifespan, right? Uh, but it get, uh, yeah, but, it gets worse it gets more active as you get older which is bad yeah yeah um, so it's almost like a feed forward loop right. right so kind of related to that um so as we get in kind of longevity there are people now in their 20s who are thinking about longevity and if they're maybe they're thinking about it in the same way as someone like myself who's in my late 50s um and so maybe they're trying to restrict mTOR so when you're that, when you're in your twenties, would restricting mTOR actually have a bad effect because you're still trying to grow? Yeah, I think you know in the twenties you're probably pretty much close to growing. Um, there's still maybe neurological circuits that need to be finished. Um, so no, I, I don't think necessarily that would be the case. Um, and I think the evidence does suggest, sadly, for those of us who are older that early interventions have more of an impact than later interventions, right? When, when you look at, you know, giving rapamycin to animals at different times of their lives, it's very clear that you can have an impact even later, but the, the, the effect, the, the amount of that impact, the extent of that impact clearly diminishes, right? Which, you know, again, m- makes us start to think about how, right? Well, how is, what does that mean? And likely has to impact stem cells in some ways, right? So. Um, that's an aspect that we don't quite understand, but, but it's clear that early intervention has more of an impact than later intervention. Right. Okay. Thank you all for watching. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel, and hit the bell button for new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well, and we'll speak to you again soon.